And it's now time to move on to the next item of business. And the next item of business is a debate on motion 12108 in the name of Anna Sarwar on waiting times. And may I invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons. And I call on Anna Sarwar to speak to and move the motion for up to eight minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. In March 2012, the then Cabinet Secretary for Health, the now First Minister, enshrined in law a legal guarantee for patients in Scotland. The legal guarantee was clear. And let me read to you what the legal guarantee says. And I quote, you have the right to start to receive agreed inpatient or day case treatment within 12 weeks of agreeing to it. Some examples of treatments include hip or knee replacements. If your agreed treatment has not started within 12 weeks, your health board must explain the reasons for this, and your health board must also take steps to ensure you start your treatment at the next available opportunity. This charter of patient rights is explicit and clear. There is no ambiguity, unless, of course, you are the Scottish Government or a health board. When is a guarantee not a guarantee Apparently, when this government and this health secretary give you one. Because as we now know, tens of thousands of Scottish patients are waiting longer, much longer than the 12-week guarantee Shona Robeson and Nicola Sturgeon promised them. Since Nicola Sturgeon made that promise, that legal guarantee to the people of Scotland in 2012 has been broken nearly 120,000 times. That's 120,000 broken promises to individuals and families across our country. But what is the consequence of this failure? Patients waiting on treatment in limbo. Told by the Health Board they have a 12-week guarantee, yet in some cases 20, 30, 40 or more weeks later, they are still waiting. This impacts on their family life. This impacts on their social life. It impacts on their ability to work. In some cases, we are actually actively prolonging people's time off work, impacting on their income and further encouraging their isolation. And it further impacts on their physical and mental well-being. For many patients, not knowing is worse than if they knew they had to wait longer than the 12 weeks in the first place. Presiding officer, every single day, the health secretary and the Scottish Government break this law. Every single day, individuals are being let down and left in limbo. A shocking breach of a guarantee enshrined in law. I want to share just one shocking example of a lack of honesty and transparency with patients. A recent case. One of my constituents was referred for orthopaedic surgery. This is what he received in writing from Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board. And I quote, under the Patients' Right Scotland Act 2011, you have a guarantee to be admitted for treatment within 12 weeks. This is the maximum you should wait. We will, of course, endeavour to see you sooner. He thought, great, waited the 12 weeks and heard nothing. And when he spoke to his GP, the GP called for an update and was advised that the actual wait would be 40 weeks. Presenting officer, it would be laughable if it wasn't so serious. Why wasn't he just told the truth? Why was he deliberately misinformed? But sadly, we know that this is not an isolated case. Nearly 120,000 patients will have received similar letters, given false hope. They will have read the word guarantee and taken it at face value. A breach of a guarantee and a breach of of trust. A lack of transparency surpassed only by a clear lack of honesty on the part of the health board. A complete failure to communicate honestly with patients. And behaviour condemned by the Ombudsman. Over the last decade, the number of complaints to the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman related to the NHS have trebled. Trebled in the last decade. And Rosemary Agnew at the weekend said, and I quote, increasingly our public reports seem to be about health matters and the theme that has emerged to me is one of communication. That is clinicians to patients and communication across different parts 
of the NHS. Presiding officer, it's simply not good enough for patients to be treated this way. But I think we need to recognise the stress and impact on our NHS staff too. With the rise in complaints, staff are often bearing the brunt of concerned patients expressing frustration at their delay in treatment when those staff themselves are under increased pressure, being overworked, undervalued and under-resourced by this government. So I welcome the Scottish Government's commitment today to amending the Charter of Patient Rights to ensure health boards are, at all times, open, transparent and honest with patients. This is a real win for patients across the country, but the Government should commit to delivering it by the end of the month. So while accepting in good faith the Scottish Government's amendment and their new commitment to ensure patients receive honest communications from the health boards on waiting times, it is absolutely unbelievable that the Scottish Government are admitting today that this has not always been the case. But there is a wider point. This amendment of the Patients' Charter can't just be a fig leaf for a much greater failure by this Government. That tens of thousands of patients in Scotland's NHS are being forced to wait longer for treatment than they should. If this Scottish Government wasn't failing patients and Scotland's NHS, they wouldn't have to worry about changing guidance on patient communication in the first place. So, Presiding Officer, I go back to that charter. It sets out six clear principles by which patients should be treated, and the Government is in breach of at least three of them. Number one, access. Your rights when using NHS health services in Scotland not being met by this government and this cabinet secretary. Number two, communication and participation. The right to be informed and involved in decisions about healthcare and services and the Scottish government's own amendment recognising a complete failure in this regard, again, not being met by this government and this health secretary. And number three, respect. In this area, perhaps more than any other, patients being disrespected by the system, being disrespected by health boards and being disrespected by this government and this cabinet secretary. That can no longer go on. We must stand shoulder to shoulder with all our patients who are being failed by this government. We must stand shoulder to shoulder with all our NHS staff who continue to go above and beyond in the most difficult of circumstances. I move the motion in my name. I now call Shona Robson to speak to and move Amendment 12108.1. Uh, up to six minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Our NHS is a remarkable institution. It's our nation's largest employer and its staff, along with those in the care sector, work day in, day out to provide care for the people of Scotland. As I said last week, it's a large and complex system and things sometimes do go wrong and fall below the standards we would expect. And I'm sure we'll hear examples of this today. But these challenges are not unique to Scotland, but we are committed to doing all we can to address them. Since the introduction of the 12-week treatment guarantee, more than 9 in 10 patients, that's 1.5 million people, have been treated within the target since it was introduced on the 1st of October 2012. And that is down to the tremendous effort of NHS staff, not just doctors and nurses, but porters, admin staff and cleaners, who all contribute to ensuring the running of our hospitals and community services uh, every day. We want to drive improvements in acute performance and also in shifting the balance of care where possible. And that's why we're taking forward the twin approach of investment and reform of our NHS to meet the rising demand and challenges now and into the future. Throughout all of this, clear engagement and communication with patients is vital, whether on the subject of their own weight for treatment or the broader design of services. And that's why we're happy to support the motion today and make clear in our amendment the actions that we will take. All parties in this chamber have been consistent in recent years in their support and advocacy of shifting the balance of care and spend towards uh, community health services to help people live longer, healthier lives at home or in a homely setting. And that's one of the reasons that by the end of this parliament, we'll ensure that at least 11% of frontline NHS spend is in primary care. And as a result, that 50% will be out with acute settings for the first time. 
Boards across, Scot er, across the country are working very hard to try and deliver waiting time standards and the guarantee. And I've made it clear to boards that exceptionally long waits must be eradicated and improvement made towards delivery. We're actively working with all boards to implement better demand and capacity planning and delivery. We also have specific work underway with clinicians and managers in a number of specialties experiencing the most significant pressures, for example, orthopaedics and ophthalmology. And in the last year, this was supported by £50 million across the whole patient pathway. On communi communication of waiting times, boards are required to advise patients by letter that they are covered by the legal guarantee. We also expect that if the board is experiencing difficulties in seeing patients within 12 weeks, they would advise the patient of the reason for the delay and an indication of the likely wait. Communication is important in a, in a patient-centred NHS and patients should be kept informed of any changes or delays in treatment. We will address this through the revision of the Charter of Rights and Responsibilities and work with boards to ensure the communication of that revised guidance. Neil Finlay. Minister, I wonder what advice you would give to my constituent who, who waited 44 weeks for an ortho, on an orthopaedic uh, uh, session just to see a specialist, not to receive treatment, and in that time was threatened with dismissal by her employer. Uh, what advice do you give her? Can I remind you to speak through the chair, please, Mr Finlay? Uh, well, as I, and I'm about to set out more, we recognise that those long waits do have an impact, not just on patients, but their families as well. And that's why we're taking the action we are taking to um, address those increasing pressures on the system. Last autumn, and what along with the Academy of the Medical Royal Colleges, health service leaders, and in partnership with patient representation, a new Scottish Access Collaborative uh, emerged. And this is a clinically led initiative uh, designed to make the connections between existing services, putting patients more in control of their care, and ensuring primary and secondary care clinicians and patients are leading on service reform. I've committed £4 million to support the development of this programme, which will ensure that people can uh, experience timely care with the most appropriate staff in the most effective place. And of course, as part of our programme for government commitments, £200 million will be invested in the lifetime of this parliament to expand elective capacity for routine operations, both at the Golden Jubilee Hospital and in the new treatment centres across Scotland, including in Neil Finlay's uh, area um, uh, in, the, in the east of the country. Presiding officer, in conclusion, the Labour motion talks about honesty, and I firmly believe that is vital. And but that works both ways. Because last week, Labour have sought to actively misrepresent a report on waiting times produced by cancer clinicians. To be clear, the 31-day and 62-day targets for cancer care are being retained, as the report makes clear. Sadly, a number of cancer clinicians are very angry that this recent report was misrepresented. And here's what leading cancer doctor David Dumlaw from Anisarwar's own home city of Glasgow said in response to his comments last week from a cancer doctor it's disappointing that Labour has sought to cherry-pick from the text of the remit and report of this group and seek to exploit the sensitivities of patients and the public in relation to cancer waiting times. The report states from the outset that the agreement was to retain the current standards and the intention was to improve them. The remit was to source professional opinion on whether the standards could be improved to better select patients for the urgent suspicion of cancer pathway and consider whether additional cancer types should be subject to the cancer waiting times target of 31 and 62 days, actually potentially increasing the number of referred patients subject to the standard. Wide cross-professional engagement has taken place. Presiding officer, no scrapping of cancer targets, but rather potentially extending those covered by the targets. So yes, presiding officer, I would welcome some honesty, no, some she's just honesty closing. in the debates we have about our health service. Our clinicians and patients deserve nothing less. I move the amendment in my name. Before I call Miles Briggs, can I remind those who wish to take part in the debate to press the request to speak buttons, or else we don't have any speakers. And uh, I call Miles Briggs for up to five minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I'd like to start by thanking the Labour Party for bringing uh, this debate forward today. It's right that we're debating the 12-week treatment time guarantee for patients due to receive planned in inpatient and daycare treatment. 
as this subject does not often get the same focus as government A&E targets, for example, the planned inpatient and day case treatment is yet another area where, sadly, this SNP government's rhetoric on our NHS simply has failed to match the reality for too many patients across Scotland. Indeed, ministers, including the First Minister herself, who steered the legislation through this Parliament, must be extremely embarrassed that the number of patients waiting more than the target treatment time has actually increased tenfold since the guarantee was even introduced in October 2012. This means that one-fifth of all eligible patients are having to wait for more than 12 weeks to receive the vital treatments that they require. All of us will be aware of extreme cases where some patients have faced waits of up to 22 months for outpatient appointments or day case treatments. The impact on individuals, patients and their families can be severe and as Anas Sarwar has already outlined a number of cases that we've heard today. Within my own Lothian region, between the end of 2012 and the end of 2017, no fewer than 25,288 patients had to wait for longer than the 12 week period the worst performance by far of any NHS board in Scotland. This is yet another indication of the particular pressures affecting the capacity within NHS Lothian as our population continues to grow and demand for services rises year on year. While I acknowledge that some individual cases may be complex and therefore the specific needs and requirements of a patient based on clin clinical advice might prevent a 12-week treatment time, the vast majority of these missed targets are down to capacity and staffing pressures within our local health services. The failure to put in place proper, a proper national workforce plan is the thread that runs throughout all of this SNP government's SNP and NHS failings. The motion today rightly talks about transparency and the need for NHS boards to communicate honestly and accurately about expected waiting times, and I wholeheartedly agree with this. As Anna Sawa has already stated, there is nothing more disheartening for a patient to expect treatment within a set period, only to be told towards the end of that period that they will have to wait for vastly longer periods of time, often weeks and months more. Rather, NHS boards need to be open and honest with patients in terms of the realistic and likely waits that they will experience before they can be confident of receiving inpatient and daycare treatment. And they should be upfront about this from the very beginning of, our, of the process. As we've already heard, clearly procedures vary across health board areas and there's vast room for improvement here. But what we need is for the best practice to be spread across Scotland. Deputy Presiding Officer, the treatment time guarantee has failed too many patients in Scotland. As one constituent recently said to me, it felt that like they'd been simply given false hope. We need to see action to help drive improvements in waiting times for planned inpatient and day cases so that we can reduce excessive waits. Clinicians across Scotland want to see a focus on best outcomes and crucially ensure that all patients are communicated with about their treatment on a transparent, open and realistic basis. It's welcome that almost six years on, the SNP government have realised that the treatment time guarantee has failed too many people and too many patients in Scotland and have now committed to amend the Charter of Patient Rights and Responsibilities to ensure patients can accurately uh, receive a waiting time estimate. But the NHS under the SNP stewardship has now seen over seven out of ten waiting targets missed just last year. What we must now see is a total improvement on an, and a renewed focus on actually patients receiving these treatments they need and the driving down of unacceptable waiting lists. I hope today's debate will help achieve that and start a real debate about how we can actually patients, see patients given the realistic times they have to wait for that treatment. And I support Anna Sawa and Labour Party's motion this evening. I now call Ross Greer for up to four minutes, please, Mr Greer. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I imagine there are very few MSPs who have not been contacted by a constituent about NHS waiting times. While the majority of people do receive treatment within 12 weeks, this is far from the reality for everyone. And as mentioned by others, sometimes severe delays have a big impact on those who have to wait. I've recently been helping a constituent get some clarity on how long they'd have to wait for a hip operation. They were told it would be 12 weeks that NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde was meeting the target. They were even specifically reassured that the recent severe weather wouldn't impact that 12-week waiting time. The problem was they were put on the list in December, and by late April, they'd still heard nothing. They were checking the mail every day. It's fair to say they were, uh, they were and they still are, quite desperate for this much-needed operation. 
When my office got involved, we found out that not only were they assigned to a hospital other than the one they'd expected, which they found understandable but wished someone had told them, the actual queue for their operation was nine months. Now, we can all understand how frustrated and angry they were to find out that an operation they expected to be imminent will now in fact take place around September, hopefully. They say themselves, if they'd just been told this from the start, it may have been frustrating, but having that information would have dramatically reduced their anxiety. The stress felt every single morning when the post was coming through the door. In this case, it was clearly inappropriate for a member of staff to go as far as reassuring them that the 12-week target would be met despite the weather at a point where it was about to be imminently missed and where the real nine-month waiting time was clearly well known and had been for some time. But it shouldn't have taken the intervention of an MSP to get this information for a patient. We know that this isn't an isolated incident. Members have already brought up other examples. Only around 70% of patients receive treatment within the 12-week timescale of being referred. And the situation is getting worse. Audit Scotland report that demand for healthcare services is increasing and more people are waiting longer to be seen. We need to understand why waiting times are increasing. I understand that funding for the NHS has increased under this government, but we need to ensure that money is well spent and that it actually matches demand. At this point, I should wear my usual European affairs hat and point out uh, that the harm already being done to our health service by the UK government's irrational and hostile immigration policies, such as the minimum income threshold, which in many cases even prevent the nurses that we so desperately need from coming and from staying here. And this is before we deal with the coming disaster for our health care and other public services, which European freedom of movement ceasing to apply after Brexit will bring. Given how uh, dependent our NHS is on citizens of other European nations and how dependent our care services, which should be preventing avoidable hospital admissions and extended stays are as well, it's clear that current waiting time situation may be very, very far from ideal, but the cack-handed anti-evidence approach of the UK government is about to make it much worse. We learned within the last few weeks that Theresa May overruled her own ministers to veto a plan to allow more overseas doctors to come and work in the UK. Last year, we found out that EU nurses registering to work in the UK, uh, the numbers dropped by 96% in a year, thanks to Brexit. While the UK government's chaotic infighting and the uncertainty this imposes on EU citizens, it's little wonder that nurses are not coming to work here. We also face the impact of sanctions, of universal credit, of social security cuts, driving more people into avoidable health problems and in turn, increasing demand. Today's Labour motion is one that the Greens are more than happy to support. It is a reasonable proposal and one which will be welcomed by patients across this country, including constituents who have got in touch with myself and, as I said, I'm sure every other member in this chamber. Beyond that, however, we need to look at the wider preventative measures which will reduce demand on the NHS. Our healthcare challenges can't be solved in a silo. A holistic, whole system approach is needed and the Greens would be more than happy to support one were the government to put it on the table. Thank you. I call Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Can I start again by thanking Anas Sarwar and the Labour Party for securing time for this important debate this afternoon. I think it's an, a very elegant motion that we're actually debating. It's very easy for us as opposition parliamentarians to throw rocks at the government about, um, about waiting times, sometimes unfairly, sometimes for reasons beyond their control. But that's not what this motion does. This motion looks in granular detail at profound failure of expectation management, uh, which our constituents are experiencing every single day. And we all have examples of constituents who have been failed in this manner. It starts with that profound mismanagement of expectations. It's often then characterized by pain and anxiety as that delay is manifest and then almost universally leads to deep frustration and anger. That's all typified in, in one example I'll give you. I was visited at the turn of the year by an elderly woman in my constituency. She'd been referred to the dental hospital for investigative surgery around signs which could be linked to an early stage of mouth cancer. Very worrying prognosis. She got her automatic letter, which we've heard about this afternoon, of the 12-week waiting time guarantee. A few months later, she got another letter saying that her wait would actually be nine months rather than the 12 weeks she'd had advertised. This was uh, troubling for her because she had to cancel a holiday that she'd booked, which was going to fall in and around that time frame. But what added insult to injury for that lady was an astonishing admission at the top of the piece of paper on which that letter was written. The fact that somebody had thought to write that the date that it had been dictated was October the 15th, but the date that it was typed was December the 17th. 
At two months, that letter had lain in a dictaphone somewhere, waiting to be typed up. This is 2018, and we're relying on 1970s technology in the cogwheels of our NHS. Now, and all of that time, she had to wait with a very troubling anxiety about what was causing the pain in her mouth. Now, I'm sure we've all got stories like that. So this isn't about the waiting times themselves. It's about the profound mismanagement of expectation we are subjecting our constituents to through the current application of this waiting time guarantee. Now, I used to think this was all to do with delayed discharge, and that's a, that's a huge part of it. There is a, a delayed discharge causes that interruption in flow through every level of our health service. And I want to actually take this moment to, to put on record my thanks to the Cabinet Secretary for intervening in the case I raised with her last week of William Valentine, who I'm very happy to say got home before the weekend, and I'm grateful to her for that. But whilst I used to think that bed blocking and the thousand people who languish in hospitals every day who are fit to go home but have no home to go to, no social care package to go home to, uh, would be the solution. It is just part of the problem. And we learned yesterday in the health committee that NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, whilst it has the lowest level of delayed discharge of any health board in the country, has some of the worst breaches of that 12-week waiting time guarantee, going up to something like 30,000, double in terms of inpatient waits uh, in just last year alone. So it's not just delayed discharge, it's care pathways, it's bureaucracy, not leaving letters lying around in dictaphones waiting to be typed up, it's demand and it's workforce planning. All of these are key to the solutions around waiting times, but it's around the expectation management that the Labour Party are right to bring the issue to Parliament today. Because when credited with the facts about the delay that they will have to endure, at brass tacks, being open and honest with patients at the start, we can expect that our constituents will... will accept that, we'll, we'll tolerate that, but it, what they cannot tolerate, what we cannot expect to, to them to tolerate is dangling this false hope of a 12-week guarantee that their health board has absolutely no way of meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I call Jackie Bailey to be followed by Ivan McKee. Jackie Bailey. Presiding officer, four, mis four minutes isn't a lot of time, so let me cut to the chase. Um, waiting times are far too long and they're growing longer with each day that passes. It's a problem in NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, and it's a problem across Scotland. Almost 120,000 people have had their waiting time guarantee breached. That's effectively the Scottish Government breaking the law 120,000 times. Their own law, presiding officer, is the one that they're breaking. Almost 16,000 people in Greater Glasgow and Clyde alone. And what lies behind these statistics are patients. Patients desperately in need of treatment, waiting in pain for months and in far too many cases over a year. In my area, the waiting list for ophthalmology is too long. I have cases where patients who require cataract surgery are being told it will be 30 weeks before they see the consultant, never mind receiving treatment. So there are delays that don't even count against the treatment time guarantee. And the NHS is front-loading the weight in order to massage their figures. This is nothing short of gaming the system. The waiting list for orthopaedics is frankly shocking. There are people waiting in excruciating pain that are now housebound because they haven't received treatment. One constituent, one constituent has crushed discs. She can barely walk. She screams with pain. She had to wait seven months for the results of a scan. One year on, she's been told to go back to her GP for a further assessment, when what she needs, and everybody acknowledges she needs it, is surgery. Another example of gaming the system. Another constituent required a hip replacement. They got their treatment time guarantee letter. Oh, yes, they did. But when they phoned, they're told that it'll be at least 50 weeks. But, oh, no, we won't put that in writing to you. Now, I've raised numerous cases in the chamber directly with the Cabinet Secretary months ago. I have written to her on several occasions on behalf of individual constituents. In fact, I could paper my walls with all the letters and her formulaic responses. Every letter tells me how concerned the Cabinet Secretary is, and I quote, to read some of the information 
contained in my correspondence about the delays in the wait for treatment. Every letter tells me how grateful the Cabinet Secretary is, and I quote, for bringing this to her attention, and how it's vitally important that she hears about patients' direct experiences. But despite all of that, no. But despite all of that, nothing changes. The health boards are simply not listening to her. The Cabinet Secretary tells us there's an extra 50 million made available last year, 11 million for Glasgow alone. I have to tell her, I don't see evidence of that in my area. Waiting times are not improving. The same problem remains. For people from my area, the Golden Jubilee, no, the Golden Jubilee, put it in writing, the Golden Jubilee, the National Waiting Times Hospital, is just down the road. They can do the orthopedic surgery. They can do the cataract surgery that my constituents are in desperate need of. Yet Greater Glasgow and Clyde rations access. They don't want to pay for patients to go to the Golden Jubilee. And the last time I looked, we were all the one NHS. It would be quicker, more convenient for patients from my area to go straight to the Golden Jubilee without Greater Glasgow and Clyde's interference. Audit Scotland have reported on waiting times on many occasions. It doesn't make pleasant reading. They've also suggested in the past that strengthening patients' rights, giving them more choice about where they are treated, will reduce waiting times. The Cabinet Secretary, when in opposition, time agreed. She wanted patients, perhaps she should listen, she wanted patients to have greater involvement and choice about where and when they are treated. She believed patients should be given a clearer indication of That's what their waiting really. time was likely to be. That presiding officer was in 2006. It's only taken 12 years, but I'm glad it's now going to happen. I welcome the commitment today that all my constituents waiting beyond their treatment time guarantee will actually be told how long they'll have to wait. But let Conclude me invite her really. to make one other commitment, that my constituents can have their operations quickly in the Golden Jubilee Hospital without any more gaming of the system. Can I call Ivan McKee to be followed by Edward Mountain? Ivan McKee. Uh, thank you, President Officer. President Officer, the motion before us today aims to tackle the issue of lack of predictability around waiting times by requiring health boards to communicate an accurate expected waiting time range to patients which is a fine objective and one we all share. The human impact of poor waiting time predictability is something we recognise, including the economic cost to individuals and to society as a whole. But as often as the case with instant solutions to complex problems, the devil can be in the detail. Many questions arise from how such predicted waiting times are to be calculated, communicated and verified. And I hope to consider in my brief remarks today some of the many issues we need to address to implement this process improvement. The motion introduces the concept of output predictability. It calls for health boards not only to achieve targets in terms of the 12-week statutory waiting time requirement, but also to predict the degree by which they will miss targets and to do so at the level of individual patients. This, while superficially attractive, does raise some interesting questions. If health boards are to communicate anticipated waiting time ranges to patients, what steps are to be in place to ensure the accuracy of those predictions? A process would, of course, be required. Indeed. Neil Findlay. Key's business analysis of the health service all the time. Do you not understand that the health service is about people, people waiting in agony on waiting lists? And when he tries to apply a business principle to everything, it takes away that human element. Ivan McKee. Uh, and does Mr Finlay not understand that him standing up and ranting for 30 seconds does absolutely nothing to solve the problem? The problem will be solved by people who understand the problem, implementing solutions to make the situation better for the people of Scotland, not by Mr Finlay standing there and ranting. So, back to the real world where we solve real problems. Uh, thank you very much. Indeed. <laughs> Hope I get some extra time for that, presiding officer. May order, continue the debate, please. Supply and demand variation. Sorry, where, where were we? A process would require, of course, to measure whether health was predicted waiting times were realised or not. And I know Mr. Finland doesn't care about that, but this is important if you're serious about implementing what you've got in your motion. 
Supply and demand variation and unforecast events mean waiting times today at the point where operation is scheduled may well be very different to the waiting time realised several months down the line. And once indicators are in place, it's but a small step to setting targets against those indicators. Further questions exist around the terminology. What is meant by the term range? A wide range could be specified by the health board, which would meet the requirement, but would be, of course, limited value to patients. What needs to be done to delineate the parameters of the anticipated allowable ranges? Similarly, the term accurate requires some clarification. What level of accuracy is acceptable and how to measure it? To track performance, health boards would need not only to collect data on the number of procedures which failed to meet the statutory targets as at present, but also on the variance between predicted and actual outcomes for each individual procedure. Verification would be required as to whether the required uh, IT systems are actually in place to collect this data and what the cost of data collection are actually going to be. The question then arises as to the definition of the indicator. The simplest may well be to track the percentage of operations which were completed within the predicted time range. This then raises the question of which is more Mr. important. Mr Johnson, either intervene or keep your comments yourself, please. So a waiting time of 16 weeks, you might want to listen, you might learn something. A waiting time of 16 weeks is initially communicated to the patient and the operation is then completed in 13 weeks. Is that a good thing or a bad thing as the initial prediction was inaccurate? That will perhaps depend on the individual circumstances of the patient. So... As always with target setting, there is of course the issue of unintended consequences. And any new indicators to track predictability performance will need to be aligned to Harry Barnes's ongoing review of indicators and targets and with the Scottish Government's National Framework Indicators Review. In conclusion, President Officer, I welcome the intent of this motion. And I've gone through it in a bit of detail, unlike the people who have proposed it clearly have. Predictability is a virtue. And I additionally look forward to the many hours we can spend on the Health and Sports Committee discussing how we're going to go about implementing this process improvement. Thank you. Thank you. I call Edward Mountain to be followed by Kate Forbes. Edward Mountain. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's only last week that I stood up in this chamber and discussed with the Scottish Government their mismanagement of the National Health Service. And it seems to be little surprise to me that I'm back here to do again the same as I did last week. Now, when thinking about which waiting time issues to talk about today, truly I was spoilt for choice. I could have gone with the issues based on NHS Highland figures, such as Highland patients having to wait 26 weeks for routine orthopaedic surgery, 47 weeks for routine ophthalmic surgery. That means that they are waiting from receiving a referral from their G GP in many cases for over a year for treatment. Now, speaking with local consultants who deliver care in the Highlands, they all know and state that Highlanders are resilient and uncomplaining. But there are times when these strengths, as I perceive them to be, become weaknesses. Many decide when they first become ill not to make a fuss too soon about their poor health. The result is that GPs and consultants are alerted to health problems in the Highlands much later than they should have been, and often symptoms are more advanced when they are diagnosed. That's why the issue of waiting times in the Highlands is indeed so critical. And what ties the diagnosis and treatment together is a simple fact in my mind, radiology. Last year, I spoke, Cabinet Secretary, about the poor state of radiology in the Highlands. This was because a letter signed by over 50 members of the Department of Medicine and General Surgery at Ragmore expressed their deep concerns about the current state of the radiology department at Ragmore. Why? Staffing shortages had led to serious delays in elective and emergency reporting, with over 8,000 films being unreported. Eight months on, there are still far too many unreported films. Neither medical diagnosis or surgical operations can take place in many cases until radiologists have interpreted scans and x-rays. Since I last spoke, the radiology department in Ragmore is now lacking, Cabinet Secretary, a clinical director, a head of service, and a radiologist services manager. Now, the Scottish Radiology Transformation Programme was meant to link up all departments across Scotland to cover short-term staffing issues, allowing reporting images to be undertaken in any radiology unit. An admiral idea. But as, N as the NHS IT system is so clunky, it doesn't assist speedy sharing of patient data between health authorities. So I'm unclear in my mind if this is a realistic solution without huge technological advancement. And as to recruiting, Cabinet Secretary, 
the plans that you have done on this seem clearly not to be working. It seems to me that new thinking is desperately needed. And I'm going to give you a suggestion, Cabinet Secretary. One solution would be for you to consider starting a radiology training scheme based in Inverness to encourage more consultants to come and live and work in the Highlands. I'm sure that once we have them there, we can encourage them to the benefits of staying there. Now, similar schemes have been developed across the remote areas of Australia, Canada and Alaska and have proved hugely successful. Now, I know this isn't a short-term solution, but let's not forget this problem has been 10 years in the making and we need the time to sort it out. That much I will give you. Presiding officer, RH NHS is something we should all really be proud of. And in many ways, I think we are. The staff who deliver healthcare have risen to the challenge created by the lack of leadership and innovation. Across Scotland, I believe the shortcomings in our NHS emanate from the top. And Cabinet Secretary, it's time for you to step up and provide the leadership that has been severely lacking and which our NHS desperately needs and really, truly deserves. Presiding officer. Thank you. I call Kate Forbes to be followed by Neil Bibby. Kate Forbes. Thank you, presiding officer. And it's probably quite appropriate to follow Edward Mountain's speech because I too would like to focus on some things that are going on in the Highlands. It was this government uh, that brought in the Patient Rights Act that Anna Sarwar quoted to ensure that patients must be supported properly and that their voices should be heard, that patients are seen as quickly as possible. And since then, despite the fact that not all patients are being seen, since then over 1.5 million inpatients and day cases have benefited from the 12 weeks treatment target. And the government amendment today re recognises that there is still room for improvement. Like Ross Greer, I too am contacted by constituents who are affected when the systems or processes don't work perfectly and things fall through the cracks. And long-term waits have serious implications, as Jackie Bailey outlined. It's about pain and discomfort that patients experience that none of us can properly understand. But to see improvement, there of course needs to be a targeted investment in services and reform of those services. And whilst we're often faced with the challenges and difficulties, we did have a breakthrough yesterday in the Highlands. We had a breakthrough on the Isle of Skye. And I want to share some lessons from that experience, which demonstrates that when there is proper engagement with patients, when there is a focus on community services, and when money is targeted well, it does make a difference. As Alex Cole Hamilton said, it's very easy to throw rocks. In fact, it must be the easiest politics going. It's far harder to build consensus, seek solutions and deliver results and to be honest along the way. After months, if not years, of severe challenges in the north end of Sky about the future of Portree Hospital, the last three months have started to turn the tide and yesterday was the light at the end of the tunnel, as I'm sure my fe fellow Highland MSPs in all parties would agree. Because yesterday, Professor Sir Lewis Ritchie shared his findings of the review of Portree Hospital in Skye and stated unequivocally that Portree Hospital would remain open. The review was announced last October after meetings with campaigners early in the year to discuss their legitimate fears and concerns about the future of Portree Hospital, where out of hours and new admissions was being um, fairly regularly suspended. They were deeply concerned about local services, but it's a lot bigger than that, because this demonstrates that where services are being cut in one area, it adds pressure to another area. Last summer, I was speaking to a healthcare professional um, at Yes, just after this comment, uh, last summer I was speaking to a healthcare professional at Ragmore Hospital, who shall remain nameless, about local residents' fears about uh, Portree Hospital. And she said to me in frustration that the problem with closing Portree Hospital is that it would just put greater pressure on big hospitals like Ragmore, and it makes it even more difficult for places like Ragmore to meet waiting times targets. So in other words, the government's motion, say, or amendment rather, says that we need to get more services into the community, we need to reduce, and in so doing, will reduce pressure on hospitals like Rake Moore, which incidentally adds a minimum of a two hour drive to most patients' journey for basic services. 
Edward Mountain. It will be very brief, Mr Mountain. It, it will be very brief, Presiding Officer. I join with Kate Forbes and welcome the report by Sir Lewis Ritchie. I think it showed a novel and innovative thought process, one which hasn't been shown by NHS Highland. Would, you, would she agree with that? Kate Forbes. Absolutely. And what I'm saying quite strongly in this debate is that it's easy to identify where the challenges are. But I think this entire process demonstrated that where a, a clinician and an <coughs> independent reviewer can come in, can build trust and faith between healthcare providers and with the public and look for novel solutions, we are actually indirectly reducing waiting times by ensuring that investment is targeted well and that services are reformed and this was all done with a very welcome backing of the cabinet secretary which demonstrates that leadership is working that leadership right from the top is working in scotland and it's having a direct impact on patients concerns in the north end of sky thank you very much and i call on neil bibby to be followed by michelle ballantyne neil bibby Thank you, President Officer. I support the motion in Anna Sawar's name, and I'm pleased that other parties in this chamber intend to support it too. Patients should get the treatment they need on time, but if they do not, then health boards need to be opened and upfront about how long patients will be expected to wait and why. It's important to tell people why, because all too often breaches of the treatment time guarantee and other waiting time standards are a symptom of the wider problems in the NHS. As always, we hear lots of rhetoric from the SNP on staffing levels and resources, but the reality is that health boards have already had to make what Audit Scotland describe as unprecedented savings. We also know from Audit Scotland that operating costs are up, demand for services is up, improvements in life expectancy have stalled, health inequalities persist, recruitment is in crisis, and the NHS itself remains underfunded. Those challenges are significant, but none of them are new. The Scottish Government put in place a Patients Right Act in 2012, but the problem is they haven't put in place a proper plan or adequate resources to deliver it. For years the SNP Government have been warned about mounting pressures on the NHS. For years they have been told that they need to deal with the NHS workforce crisis. But what we see is a situation where our NHS is overstretched and underfunded and that the NHS workers are overworked. President officer, the government's failure to rise to foreseeable challenges has prevented patients from getting the care they need and, and when they are entitled to get it. It's time the government admitted it and addressed it. Across the country, patients are waiting too long for the care they need. In my own region, a constituent recently phoned a hospital about an appointment just to be told to go to a and &E and complain of heart pains. She was told this because otherwise she'd be waiting months to see a specialist about her heart complaint. And a number of families who once had open access to the RAH Children's Ward, the ward the Health Minister closed, have told me they now have to wait longer to see a doctor in Glasgow. And as Jackie Bailey said, official statistics show also that there are thousands of cases uh, of patients in NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde and throughout Scotland where the treatment time guarantee has been breached. Of course, the SNP's waiting time guarantee is a legal one. It has been written into law. To put it simply, if the guarantee has been broken, that means the law has been broken. The First Minister tells us we are to judge the SNP on the record. Well, we can, and when it comes to health, it is criminal. We already have heard this afternoon, the SNP Government and Health Secretary have broken their own waiting times law over 118,000 times. Presiding officer, breaking a law can hardly make Shona Robinson Scotland's Al Capone, but it's certainly she is guilty of failing Scotland's NHS, and in the next reshuffle, she might find out she's not untouchable. Because the Health Secretary is running out of excuses. Shona Robinson told us last week, she's running out of excuses, she told us last week that adequate funding was being given to the NHS. Scottish Labour disagree, because if there is sufficient resources going to the NHS, then why are we seeing 3,000 operations already cancelled this year? a and &E waiting time's up, children's wards being closed, and 118,000 people waiting longer than the SNP's treatment time guarantee. 118,000 people, that's people waiting for hip replacements, knee replacements, stents, cataracts, heart surgery. Real people with real needs let down by this government. It is welcome that patients should start to get open 
and honest information on how long they are expected to wait for treatment and why. But that's the very least they deserve. We now need to see urgent action so, so that far more of Scotland's patients get their treatment on time. And that's why I urge members to support the Labour motion. Thank you. I call Michelle Ballantyne to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Today's debate on waiting times isn't a new issue. Back in 2006, Audit Scotland reported that the NHS in Scotland had made significant progress in reducing waiting times. However, some of this had been achieved by using the Golden Jubilee National Hospital, private providers and waiting times initiatives, all of which had been at relatively high cost. Evidence suggested that then that short-term increases in activity at particular points in the system did not lead to sustained reductions in waiting times. Despite this knowledge, in 2011, the government brought forward the Patients' Rights Act, which enshrined 12-week waiting time guarantees. So for many of us, it's not surprising that we are here today listening to statistics of breached waiting times and the distress and suffering behind those statistics. So why do we have waiting time targets and what do they mean for us as decision makers? For government and indeed our communities, waiting time targets signal that healthcare is being monitored, governance is in place and patients' rights are being protected. As a nurse, operational and strategic manager in the NHS for over 25 years, I witnessed the impact that government targets and guarantees have on our, our care systems. The operational imperative of not breaching a target, driving decision making and leading to some of the scandals that we've seen over the years. Waiting time targets are not clinically led. If you're in pain or suffering with acute mental health problems, being told you will be treated within 12 weeks feels like a lifetime. But then to discover the information you receive is not accurate and your expectations will not be met can be devastating both to your physical and mental well-being. Patients want to be given accurate, timely information. Health and community care is a complex system whose efficiency is dependent on all its interrelated parts. Waiting lists and waiting times are affected by each part of the system and by the links between them. There is, of course, a place for short-term approaches to tackle delays, but they need to be part of a wider strategy that looks at the whole system for achieving a sustainable reduction in waiting times. At around 12.9 billion, our NHS spending accounts for 43% of the overall Scottish government budget. Whilst rising operating costs have meant that health boards have had to make unprecedented savings of almost 390 million just to break even. In October 2017, Audit Scotland concluded that simply adding more funding was no longer sufficient to achieve the step change needed across the system. Now, we in this chamber can trade insults, cast aspersions of blame, and try to outdo each other on who is most virtuous, but the reality is that this will not address the real problems that our NHS faces. So, in conclusion, I would say this. Do I blame the SNP and their government for the failure to meet waiting times? No, I don't. They don't control patient demand or indeed many of the bottlenecks and realities in individual areas that impact on waiting times. But do I hold the SNP and their government responsible for their failure to meet waiting times? Absolutely. They introduced the Patients' Rights Act, they established the measures, they took responsibility and they would, after all, want the credit if it was achieved. So yes, of course, they are responsible when these promises are broken. And that's the bottom line in this debate. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call Fulton McGregor for the closing speeches. Sir, and I um, remind the Chamber and the Parliamentary Liaison Officer to the Health Secretary. The Patient Rights Scotland Act 2011 created a statutory treatment time guarantee of 12 weeks and already over 1.5 million inpatients in day cases have already benefited from the 12 weeks treatment target since it was introduced, as has been mentioned by others. We can see a programme of record investment and reform taking place in our NHS, which is resulting in care being removed from hospitals where appropriate and integrated back into the community, and that is the right thing to do. Our budget for health has seen significant increases under the SNP government and will continue to increase this spending by £2 billion. We must accept that these changes won't happen overnight, but we are taking the correct steps to see 
real change and reform in our NHS, and we have the best possible treatments readily, readily available in the future. It is the responsibility, of course, of health boards to ensure that eligible patients receive their treatment within 12 weeks. This may mean that, with patients' consent, the health board makes arrangements for a patient to be treated in another health board area to ensure the 12-week guarantee is met. Now, no one in this debate today, President Officer, is saying that all waiting times are met. We know that this is not the case in the Cabinet, and the Secretary herself has never said this. As a constituency MSP, I often have exasperated patients come to me who have waited over their time, and these often relate, as others have said, to, to orthopaedic uh, operations. Uh, I, what I do is I work with the NHS board to try and resolve the situation, and many times we are able to get the situation resolved to the constituent satisfaction. The vast majority, however, of these times are met. And of course, staffing is an important issue in the cases where the targets are not met. And that's why I was in the local, my own local press last week defending agency staff against what I perceived as attacks from both Labour and Tory politicians locally. Not because I want agency staff per se, but I realise that with the health staff leaving in the face of Brexit, amongst other factors such as austerity from the UK government, there's a reality about how we meet the needs of the service and agency staff, when they are there, do a very valuable and good job. I'm not going to have time, Mr Briggs, sorry. The Scottish Government have always made clear to boards that patients with the greatest clinical needs, such as cancer patients, continue to be seen quickly. There are two national cancer standards in place which NHS boards are asked to deliver against. The current standard is that 95% of all patients meeting the criteria should wait no longer than 62 or 31 days, as set out by the Scottish Government. And I'm pleased to say that uh, a briefing from NHS Lanarkshire this morning, NHS Lanarkshire has consistently delivered on both cancer sta standards. The most recent figures published show that NHS Lanarkshire had 96.1% of patients starting treatment within 62 days of urgent referral with a suspicion of cancer, and 98% cancer patients starting treatment within 31 days of decision to treat. So these targets were made in other health board areas as well, but it's a, a, an example of NHS Lanarkshire's continued excellent performance in this area and is an example of the dedication and hard work of the staff. And I know that they will continue to maintain and improve the performance and ensure patients continue to receive the highest standards of care while also avoid, avoiding delays where possible. Presiding officer, in the short time I've got left, I would just like to, to end on a positive story because a lot of the time in the chamber we hear um, of, of situations where things have maybe went wrong. For some months now, I've been, had the pleasure to assist my constituents, sadly diagnosed with stage four colorectal cancer, in assessing various treatment programmes for his terminal cancer diagnosis. Although faced with aggressive treatment for an aggressive cancer, my constituent, an otherwise healthy father to a young adoptive family, was keen to explore all available treatment options, including treatments available through a clinical trial. Unfortunately, my constituent was placed in the placebo group for the trial he joined, and seeing no benefit in continuing with the treatment offered essentially no different to standard line chemotherapy, seeking to address this particular course of treatment not routine, routinely funded by the NHS or by any other means. Without getting into any great detail of my constituent, he was devastated to be informed by his MDT that the treatment he was seeking to access was not considered to be appropriate at that point in time. However, the UK lead clinician for the treatment in question found my constituent, constituent actually to be the optimal patient for this course of treatment and feeling that he should be offered the treatment to be agreed. Uh, so, sorry, it should be offered treatment and agreed to also support my constituent in his appeal to be treated in Scotland with NHS funding. And I'm delighted to say that this funding has been agreed with my constituent's treatment uh, due to uh, start later on this month. My constituent at the start of this year expected to have a short number of months left to live and now he can possibly look forward to many more years with his young family. I'll leave it on that, President Officer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr McGregor. And I move to closing speeches now. I call Brian Whittle to be followed by the Minister, Eileen Campbell. Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm going to start by referring uh, members to my register of interest in that I have a close family member who's a healthcare professional in the Scottish NHS. Today, uh, we are debating uh, the patient charter, uh, that charter which states that uh, there's a 12-week guarantee for treatment, which was set in stone uh, by the SNP. What we're saying is, in the interest of patient care and the principles of honesty and transparency, NHS boards should communicate an accurate expected waiting time range to patients. Now, I'm sure that we all agree that in, uh, it is the opposition's responsibility to scrutinise government policy and to hold the SNP to account, to account whatever they have failed to deliver for Scotland. And in the Labour's motion, which the Scottish Conservatives will support, that scrutiny is being exercised. 
The fact is that it's such an obvious point we are debating is one that should concern us all. It should not take an opposition debate to raise such a basic fundamental principle to get the SNP to take action that I think as Anna Sawar pointed out in his opening address. It is important, presiding officer, that when we're debating health, we do so in a manner that does not undermine work that has been done on the front line every day. I think Michelle, Michelle Ballantyne was at pains to highlight, and using her 25 years of experience uh, in nursing, she highlighted it, how important it is that when we debate health, we are cognizant that we are attempting to improve the health outcomes for patients and healthcare professionals. Now, the debate today has given other speakers the opportunity to raise their own, locals issues, own local issues. And we've heard from Miles Briggs and Anna Sawar and Ross Greer and, and Jackie Bailey, among others, and Edward Mountain uh, took his time to, to raise uh, care in the Highlands uh, and raising the issue of radiology in Ragmore. And to his credit, he, he came up with some positive solutions uh, for the Cabinet Secretary. Um, but as I said, uh, Presiding Officer, I don't think this is a, a typical health debate. The tone was set in the opening speeches, and it was obvious, that, quite honestly, that this would be a non-debate. See, we do need to address waiting times in the round. We do need to look at the acute waiting times, things like mental health, which obviously deteriorate over time with that increasing financial time and personal cost, as we heard all too clearly uh, highlighted in the previous debate. And physiotherapy for musculoskeletal conditions, where a waiting time of a year for what is essentially an immediate requirement makes an acute issue long-term costly with a potential impact on physical and mental health. Alex Cole Hamilton highlighted the anxiety of his constituent uh, waiting for treatment and what could have been a very serious issue and that delay and that false hope of treatment impacts in all areas, areas of her life and we wish, we wish her well. See, as I've said today, uh, presiding officer, today's debate is, for me is a non-debate and I think the net result is that uh, Labour are uh, using their debating time has been taken up with what the Scottish Government had already agreed to in law. We could have been debating how we deal with waiting times, what they mean, and the language we use when, they dis when we discuss them. If you're a cynical presenting officer, you may consider that the Scottish Government have agreed to the obvious to take the heat out of an issue that they should have already dealt with. Perhaps they have become so paralysed for fear of doing anything wrong, they are reticent to do anything of note at all. Presenting officer, there is so much more to do in, if we're to really to tackle uh, the issues that we face within the health service. We have to talk about education, nutrition, and physical activity, and planning, the environment, the rural economy, all have a footprint in improving the health of our nation. So if waiting times are the barometer for the health of our NHS, then it reads, change is required. Now, I welcome that change will be taking place as a result of this debate, but I struggle to see how today's debate will impact on the real issues facing our NHS staff and their patients. It is important that issue, this issue is addressed, and for that, I do thank Labour for bringing this to the Chamber. It doesn't need any amendment from the Scottish Conservative, so obvious it is. However, the fact that it had to be raised should actually concern us all. Presenting officer. Thank you very much, Mr Mitchell. And I now call the Minister, Eileen Campbell. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, and like all MSPs, I want to take my opportunity to thank all our NHS staff and recognise the phenomenal work that our NHS does day in, day out. An institution that is 70 years old this year, founded and based on the principles of being free at the point of delivery, universal, not based on wealth, equitable and of high quality. Those principles may be 70 years old, but they are as relevant now as they have ever been. And while the core principles remain a constant, what has undoubtedly changed has been the context, the demand and the challenges that the NHS and we all as a society now face. Meeting these challenges requires mature debate and we've heard some of that uh, this afternoon. And is why we, in this government, we seek to meet those challenges with a twin approach of investment and of reform. And it's why we will drive improvements in acute performance and shift the balance of care from acute to primary and social care, as our amendment makes uh, clear. And as we uh, rightly celebrate all that is good and all that is positive about the NHS, we all recognise that sometimes things fall below the standards we would expect. And we heard some of that today. And it's important that we hear that and it's important that we learn from that direct experience. Situations that will be very real for those individuals, but who require and they deserve a clarity of information and reassurance. And I think Ross Greer's uh, contribution captured the essence of that. And that is why, as the Cabinet Secretary, 
articulated in her opening remarks, we are committed to revising the Charter of Patients' Rights and Responsibilities and work to work with the boards to ensure the communication of that revised guidance. This experience of people and patients is what motivates our determinations to make the improvements that we know we need to see. Minister, for taking that intervention, will she commit to bring to this Parliament the suggested amendments to the Charter so they can be discussed and debated, and also bring forward what guidance she will give to health boards so we can see what language they will be using when writing to patients? Minister Ian Campbell. The health boards, this process, and of course, in due course, we will publish uh, that. Uh, again, though, perhaps might be a lesson, though, that if you seek to have these things discussed in chamber, perhaps it's an approach to take to come to this, uh, this chamber with constructive ideas and uh, solutions to the challenges that we face. But of course, the cabinet secretary we will publish uh, the, uh, the, the revised guidance in due course. This dedication to improve, uh, to make improvement is why £50 million was allocated to support the reduction in hospital waiting times. It's why the Cabinet Secretary launched, backed by £4 million, the new access collaborative that seeks to improve the way elective care services are managed and reduce waits. It's why £200 million will be invested in the life of this Parliament to expand the elective capacity for routine operations at the Golden Jubilee Hospital and in the new treatment centres across Scotland. This will reduce, health, reduce waiting times and take the pressure off. It's also why Scotland has been the first nation in the UK to publish a national health and care workforce plan and also the only nation committed to safe staffing legislation, building on the record high levels of NHS staffing delivered under this government. Presiding officer, a list of actions from this government relentless in its pursuit of enabling our NHS to meet the needs of the people it serves, but not blinded by the challenges that we face or the experiences of people who in the here and now. Now, where there have been contributions that seek to be constructive and solve the challenges, we will of course listen. We will listen and respond to the ideas from Edmund Mountain on radiology and attracting professions to the Highlands. will not necessarily agree with everything he said or that of his colleague uh, Michelle Ballantyne, but definitely appreciate the attempt to be constructive and of course the experience, the professional experience of, of Michelle. We will absolutely listen to the example from Kate Forbes. We are engagement, we are in consultation with people and communities enabled a better decision in the Isle of Skye. What that means for future engagement between the NHS boards and the communities they serve. And it's also why we'll heed the words from Ross Greer, who urged a broader examination of the issues to understand, for instance, the impact of the hostile immigration environment that's been established and, of course, the impact of the freedom of movement restrictions under Brexit. Presiding officer, you'll notice there wasn't a mention of the Labour MPs who come to this chamber and do well to criticise, but don't do as well when it comes to coming with ideas to remedy the concerns that they have aired. So we'll get on, so I'll get on, well, we'll get on with the job of supporting supporting our NHS, building on the high satisfaction rates felt across Scotland, that's improving on the target, seeing nine in ten, out of ten patients, 1.5 million people being treated within the 12-week uh, treatment guarantee since introduction in 2012. And we'll continue uh, to uh, build on uh, our, please, the strengths of our NHS to ensure that it's in a position of strength for the next 70 years to come. Thank you. And David Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and this has been uh, an excellent debate on a vital issue. And I want to thank members from across the Chamber for their insightful, their knowledgeable and their strongly felt contributions. Waiting times are always difficult, and when a patient is suffering from an illness or an injury, any time between cause, diagnosis and treatment is unwanted. It prolongs the pain, as well as adding additional stress to mental and physical well-being. Members this afternoon, like Jackie Bailey, Anna Sawa, Ross Greer, Alex Cole Hamilton, Edward Mountain, Kate Forbes, uh, Neil Bibby, and Michelle Ballantyne, have illustrated this perfectly by quoting dissatisfied constituents who felt let down by the system. A system presiding officer that put in place the Patients' Rights Scotland Act 2011, in place to guarantee a 12 week treatment time. This allowed hospitals and boards to manage expectations and patients to have a known time frame. What we can't forget, President Officer, is that waiting times aren't just simple facts and figures. Behind every delay in getting an operation or seeing a consultant, there's an individual often with anxiety, pain and stress. I remember, President Officer, when 18-year-old and Renes writer Bette McHardle came to see me because she was told she had to wait 11 months for a relatively simple 
Kasrak operation. And she said, it's vital that we Oxygerians are able to lead independent lives and still contribute to society. And it has to be remembered that many are still caring for a partner or family member. Without the basic support of maintaining adequate eyesight, we rapidly become more dependent on the NHS and care services and cost the state. So every statistic holds similar stories. Now, why I can't fault NHS Highland in trying to clear the backlog and reduce the waiting time, it's concerning that these procedures are going to be outsourced to private companies and other boards at great costs. For the second year in a row, NHS Scotland failed to meet seven out of eight of the key performance targets according to Audit Scotland's report. Now, one of the key problems identified is the widespread difficulty meeting demand and the impact it is having on waiting times. Frontline NHS staff work tirelessly to try and ensure that staffing issues, lack of resources and underfunding doesn't compromise patient care, but they do so in face of growing pressure. And I don't just take my word of it. Audit Scotland in their 2017 report said, and I quote, people are waiting longer to be seen with waiting lists for first outpatient appointment and inpatient treatment increasing by 15 and 12 per cent respectively in the past year. And the other big issue, presiding officer, is life expectancy. The life expectancy gap is increasing with men from the most deprived areas now living on an average 12.2 years less than the more affluent counterparts and women is 8.6 years. And those from deprived areas increasingly likely to spend more time in ill health with nine years for men and 11.5 years uh, for women. On top of this, one key area for waiting times were missed, cancer has higher rate among disadvantaged communities but lowest detection rates. Those from deprived communities are most likely to be diagnosed with breast and lung cancer at stage four, while those the least deprived are most likely to be diagnosed at stage one uh, or two. So for those from the most disadvantaged areas being diagnosed uh, later, early access to treatment is key to improving outcomes and reducing the life expectancy gap. This disparity must be addressed as a matter uh, of urgency. Uh, so in conclusion, presiding officer, the NHS turned 70 on July the 5th, and we're still having to fight to protect it. As the founder Nye Bevan said, discontent arises from a knowledge of the possible as contrasted with the actual. Those deba these debates are frustrating because we know we can do better. Do better for the NHS, for the frontline staff, for the patients and for the families of patients. And I ask you all to support our motion at decision time today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Stewart. That concludes our debate on waiting times. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 12137. Point of order, Ms Harper. And officer. I'm wondering what is the process of amending the official record when information shared in this chamber is incorrect or inaccurate? And I'm asking because yesterday, during the dangerous dogs debate, when referring to the Take the Lead campaign, Finlay Carson made an incorrect statement referring to me. He said, it is somewhat disappointing but not surprising that Emma Harper, the parliamentary liaison officer to Fergus Ewing, who originally backed the campaign, has now backed off and supports the far from satisfactory postcode lottery option of additional local authority bylaw powers. I was not in chamber for the debate to respond. So I'd like to note that I have never made any personal comment or statement about amending bylaws. So I'm therefore seeking your advice on how Mr. Carson can amend his mistake on the official record. Can I thank Ms. Harper, first of all, for the advance notice, the point of order. As you will know, the official report for yesterday cannot be uh, amended. That was a, a correct record of what was stated in the chamber at the time. However, uh, Ms. Harper has drawn the matter to the attention of Mr. Carson, and Ms. Harper has herself put her own comments on the record uh, for all to see. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 12137 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Bureau setting out a business programme if anyone uh, wishes to speak against this, please press your button now and I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move the motion. Formally moved. Thank you very much. And no one wishes to speak against it, therefore the question is that motion 12137 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are, thank you. We turn now to decision time. The first question is that amendment 12107.3 in the name of Shona Robison, which seeks to amend motion 12107 in the name of Anas Sarwar on NHS Tayside public inquiry be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. 
We are agreed. The next question is that Amendment 12107.2 in the name of Miles Briggs, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Anas Sarwar be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the next question is that Motion 12107 in the name of Anas Sarwar as amended on NHS Tayside Public Inquiry be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that Amendment 12108.1 in the name of Shuna Robertson which seeks to amend Motion 12108 in the name of Anas Sarwar on waiting times be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The final question is that Motion 12108 on, in the name of Anas Sarwar as amended on waiting times be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. We'll move now to Members' Business, the name of Rachel Hamilton, on the condition of Scotland's roads. We'll just take a few moments for the Member and Ministers to change seats. <laughs>